Thank you for joining me once again today as we study God's Word concerning prophecy and how it is being fulfilled in our time. I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus Christ who has given us prophecy. Thank you for the principles that are given to us in the Word of God to understand our times and the future and how to think about these things. And Father, we pray that you will guide us today as we look at religious liberty and how it is being undermined. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have learned from the Bible and from history, religious liberty is ultimately the target of the New World Order. Nebuchadnezzar demonstrated this in ancient Babylon when he raised up an image that everyone was supposed to worship. Um, and in Revelation 13, it tells us that we are also going to have a globalized religion at the end of time as well. For it says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But I have for a long time wondered how this would all come about, especially in America and other Western nations with constitutions that emphasize strong liberties and freedoms such as religious freedom and religious liberty. Revelation 13 verse 17 tells us that there is going to be a change and sanctions will be imposed on those who will not receive the mark of the beast and worship the beast. Verse 17 of chapter 13 says, uh, let's start with verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, that's talking about sanctions on those who refuse to go along with the new world order religion. Um, verse 15 also says that those who do not worship the new world order religion are going to be killed. Uh, we'll just read that. It says, And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there will be even a death penalty for those who refuse to go along. <clears throat> We've been talking a lot about the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. How should we understand the facts and the details? We need to put them all together in the big picture. You know, one time I had a, a person come to me and say, well, we don't need prophecy. We need Jesus. Actually, I've had that a couple of times over the years. Well, let me ask you a question. Who is the center of prophecy? It is Jesus. And who is it that gave us prophecy? Well, it is Jesus. So how can you separate prophecy from Christ? After all, it is Christ that we are looking toward uh, that's going to come in the clouds of glory, which is prophesied in Scripture. It is Christ who is the center of prophecy. He's the focus of prophecy and the source of prophecy. So you can't separate them. And if you do separate them, you lose the value of both. Um, if, you, if you separate them, you have prophecy that has no real foundation in the gospel um, and Jesus is not at the center of it and if you separate them Jesus becomes emaciated or perhaps less potent in helping us understand our times the Bible's full of prophecy and it's easy to forget and as we study, remember that in Luke 21, verse 28, let's have a look at Luke 21, verse 28. It tells us, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. We are to rejoice, my friends, when we see prophecy being fulfilled, for our redemption draweth nigh. 
There's also a very interesting statement in the um, Signs of the Times of October 1, 1894, which says, God would have us study the events that are taking place around us and compare them with the predictions of His Word in order that we may understand that we are living in the last days. So it's very important for us to look at current events in light of Bible prophecy. It is those things that happen in the world around us that confirm that the things that have been given to us in the inspired word are actually going to happen. It also gives us confidence that what isn't yet fulfilled is going to be fulfilled. For every detail of Bible prophecy is going to come to pass. So uh, let us remember this very interesting statement also from Great Controversy, page 592. It says, The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. This is talking about Sunday worship. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. Very, very powerful statement. How would such a massive change take place in American attitudes and political life? Now that's, that's almost incomprehensible, at least a few years ago. But today we are beginning to see some changes in the attitudes of Americans that are very ominous. And it seems impossible, though, that in a nation with such strong free speech and strong religious liberty issues, for it to pass a law requiring worship on a certain day of the week, namely Sunday. But on September 11, 2001, I began to realize how these things can change. Terrorism provided the perfect excuse to make changes to constitutions that would roll back the clock, so to speak, right back to medieval times. I, was, uh, I could hardly believe my ears surprised when I heard uh, George W. Bush announce that he was freezing the assets of the terrorists. I immediately thought of Revelation 13, 17, which we've just quoted a few moments ago. Um, that verse tells us that you won't be able to buy and sell. That's what freezing the assets is all about. And so now we know what a no-buy, no-sell law would look like in modern times. Freezing assets would make it impossible to do business and you would be reduced to the barter system. They have to put this in place and they have to have some reason to do it, some basis to do it, that doesn't include those who are the ultimate target of it. You see, it has to come in by stealth. And so it comes in openly and it's not at first against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath. It comes in against those who are Muslim extremists, you know, and, and Muslim extremists have become the excuse for almost every constitutional um, undermining. But I was astonished at how quickly other elements of the U.S. Constitution came under assault as President Bush authorized torture in secret prisons, which was something that was from the Middle Ages. Indefinite detentions, also something from the Middle Ages. Trial by tribunal rather than trial by a jury of peers. Assumption of guilt rather than assumption of innocence and even extrajudicial killing, which is basically assassination. And on and on it went. There was no end of it, it seemed. And it was amazing how quickly this thing unraveled. The Constitution of the United States is now basically a shell of its former self. Oh yes, they haven't changed a single word of it. They simply changed the definitions or the way they apply the law. 
I was stunned as I realized that these were not just happening to foreign fighters, terrorists from other nations, but also to U.S. citizens and citizens of other Western countries as well. And you'll notice, uh, for instance, in Europe, you have a lot of people that are European citizens who have become terrorists. And now they're using those terrorists as the basis to strengthen laws in Europe that would fight against terrorism. But ultimately, those laws will be used against God's people. And I realized that we had crossed a prophetic line, a line that could never be recovered. We had reached a tipping point, so to speak. And then I noticed something even more incredible. I saw how friendly George W. Bush was with the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And I, I began to put it all together. You see, the things that he was implementing um, from the Middle Ages in, in, in the uh, legal framework of the United States in dealing with terrorism were actually the very same principles that were used during the Inquisition um, of Spain and other places throughout Europe. And now they're coming into the United States, which was established to avoid such things. Or the, 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 the legal environment, the Constitution, was designed to prevent ever returning to those things. And now, in the environment of terrorism, this has actually happened. But I noticed that President Bush was snuggling up to the Catholic Church and its hierarchy all throughout this period. He was surrounding himself with Roman Catholic speechwriters, for instance. One of them said later, I used to say that there were more Catholics on President Bush's speechwriting team than any Notre Dame starting lineup in the last, past half century. That was William McGurn that made that statement. President Bush also surrounded himself with Catholic intellectuals, advisors, bishops, politicians. The Religious News Service said these Catholics, and thus Catholic social teaching, have for the past eight years been shaping Bush's speeches, policies, and legacy to a degree perhaps unprecedented in U.S. history. That's quite a statement. Unprecedented in U.S. history. President Bush's first public outing after he became president was to have dinner with Washington's Archbishop Theodore McCarrick. Within a few months, he asked a priest to come and bless the White House. He was acting so much like a medieval potentate that I began to realize that the changes to the U.S. Constitution were not by accident. No wonder we're told in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 451, that the United States will repudiate every principle of its Constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. There's a constellation of issues that are converging and pushing toward the prophetic fulfillment of the aims, the ultimate aims of the New World Order, which is targeting God's people and their religious liberty. The U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights is like a bicycle wheel. There are many spokes in a bicycle wheel, and today we see the spokes being taken away one by one. If you take away one spoke in a bicycle wheel, will it continue to work properly? Yes. If you take away two, probably, it would still continue to work. Take away three, four, five, I don't know how many, but at some point, it will lose its integrity and it will collapse. And so today we see the spokes being taken away one by one. There are none left, really, <laughs> And it all happened in about 14 or 15 years. 9-11 removed protections from torture, protection from indefinite detention in secret prisons, the right to a trial by a jury of peers. It removed the assumption of innocence. It removed the right of a defendant to know his accusers in some cases. It removed the right of a defendant to know the accusations against him. And it even removed protections 
from search and seizure without a court order. That's a lot, my friends. That's huge. If you are accused of terrorism in the United States, you lose all those constitutional rights automatically. But religious extremists have pushed Western governments even further. Extrajudicial killings or assassination, especially by drone, uh, is now a feature of any U.S. president and his, and his foreign policy. Massive digital surveillance on everyone. <laughs> One new or relatively new NSA facility in Utah was recently opened. It has the capability of handling five zettabytes of data, and that's an enormous amount. Think about what a zettabyte is. Um, you know, when you, when you let, let's, let's try to define what this is. A, a byte is just one tiny digital piece of information. A kilobyte is a thousand of those tiny bits of information. Then a megabyte is a thousand kilobytes. Uh, and you can see that it goes in multiples of a thousand. After a megabyte comes a gigabyte, which is a thousand megabytes. After a gigabyte comes a terabyte. That's right, a terabyte, which is um, a thousand gigabytes. But what comes after a terabyte? <laughs> you can't go down to the electronics shop and buy this. So most people don't know what it is. What comes after a terabyte? Well, that's a petabyte. A petabyte is a thousand terabytes. That's huge. That's an enormous amount of storage, just at the petabyte level. But after that, then comes something else that most people don't know about. It's an exabyte. After an exabyte, which is a thousand petabytes, comes a zettabyte, which is a thousand exabytes. So we have a thousand, 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 multiples of a thousand about eight times. That's incredible. That represents something that is hard to imagine. Um, for instance, let's think about this for just a second. If you had um, five zettabytes of data, that's the equivalent of 250 billion, that's billion with a B, billion, 250 billion DVDs. How about that? How many DVDs do you have in your home? Huh? <laughs> you don't have quite that many, I don't suppose. 250 billion DVDs. Well, that's still hard to imagine. Uh, especially older people may not really understand you know, the size of, of that. So let's put it in concrete terms that perhaps everyone can understand. If you took the equivalent of 250 billion DVDs and you put that in, on traditional paper in traditional filing cabinets, you would have enough filing cabinets to cover twice the space of the United States of America. Just putting the filing cabinets together, one right next to the other. Imagine that. That's a lot of data. And that's enough to process the digital footprint of every man, woman, and child in the United States and many, 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 much more than that. Many, many more people can be tracked just with that much data processing. Friends, all these things are laying the foundation for the persecution of God's people. Surveillance is very important to that. It was very important to the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, not with all the technology and that we have today, but uh, today we have very expensive processes that require huge resources, all being designed, yes, to fight terrorism, but ultimately, they will expand and fight against God's last people, God's remnant people on the earth. What is Satan trying to do? He's aiming to put God's people in a corner 
so that they have no hope of escape, no room to move. Every move, every word will be under his control, unless God intervenes, of course. Do you think God can deliver you from all that? Of course he can. If God can deliver, deliver Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, God can deliver you from a system that's built to corner his faithful people. One of the closest issues protecting religious freedom is freedom of speech. I've been eyeing this for a long, long time, wondering when it would rise to the surface and be undermined. Religious liberty that has a bodyguard and religious speech is that or rather freedom of speech is that bodyguard if you remove freedom of speech you lose religious liberty so what happened how is it that religious freedom is undermined by freedom of speech or the loss of freedom of speech well you may remember that the attack in Paris on Charlie Hebdo that did it. Charlie Hebdo is a satire magazine. Uh, it made fun of everything, including Roman Catholicism, Muslims, Christians. Well, now, after the attack on Charlie Hebdo, there is a raging debate over limits of freedom of speech. Many governments are working on legislation or talking about how to limit freedom of speech. Pope Francis even got into the debate. One cannot provoke, he said. One cannot insult people's faith. One cannot make fun of faith. There is a limit. Every religion has its dignity in freedom of expression. There are limits. He also added, if my good friend Dr. Gaspari, who was standing next to him on the airplane when he said this, and Dr. Gaspari is the papal travel coordinator, says a curse word against my mother, he continued, he can expect a punch. It's normal, it's normal. You cannot provoke. You cannot insult the faith of others. You cannot make fun of the faith of others. There are some key points here. Let us remember, papal history restricted freedom of speech and thought, incidentally, and persecuted those who didn't agree or go along. Freedom of speech or religion are subject to what is good for society in Roman Catholicism and its teachings. Individual freedom of speech can be restricted. Who defines what is good for society? You know, if you're going to restrict some speech, you have to decide what speech is acceptable and which speech is not. So who decides what's good for society? Now, the Waldenses exercised freedom of speech for a thousand years, and it was very dangerous for them. In fact, they went and preached the gospel. They went from place to place with their little um, portions of Scripture hidden in their clothing or hidden in their baggage or whatever, and they would look for opportunities to share the Word of God and undermine the teachings of Rome. That was their purpose, and it was very dangerous. Many of them lost their lives because of it. Uh, please notice that Pope Francis also spoke of his mother. Well, to the Pope, his mother is the church. He's saying that those who give warning against Rome will get the papal punch of persecution. He was preparing minds of millions to reject the message to come out of Babylon, Revelation 18. He was preparing to oppose your soul-winning Bible work, my friends. We've also reached a tipping point in some other areas as well, and I think it's important to note them. Uh, for instance, we've reached a tipping point in the homosexual movement. Gay rights, especially the right to marriage, is a burning issue today. Um, Genesis 9, verse 4, 19, pardon me. Genesis 19, verse 4 is an important text that will help us understand this. Let's have a look at that. Revelation 19, verse 4. This is the story of Lot. 
And the, Bi the Bible says, and before they lay down, that's when Lot had the angels in his home and his wife and his two daughters and so on. They were all there. And before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all people from every quarter. And they, of course, demanded that Lot bring out these two men. Um, Lot shockingly offered them his two daughters. <laughs> Imagine what they must have thought about that. Well, they didn't want his two daughters. They wanted those two men. So they were knocking on the door, so to speak, uh, of Lot's house. And today the men of the city are knocking on the door of religious liberty. They want to prevent you from speaking against them. They want to limit your freedom of speech. They want to make it so politically incorrect, so out of character, that you will not open your mouth against their lifestyle. And it's logical. And by the way, they want equality. <laughs> equality is very important to the homosexual movement. They want equality in society, um, but they believe that equality in society isn't really equality if there's even one unit of society that isn't going to accept them. Now, conservative religion has been the most ardent opponent of homosexuality and gay rights. So for them to have true equality, they would have to remove all religious opposition. But it isn't just removing opposition. In the marketplace, equality means jobs, even CEOs of corporations, laws against hiring discrimination cr are cropping up everywhere. Unless gays have access to the top executive positions, they do not consider themselves as having equality. And there's a long list of corporations in which the, the heads or key figures are gay openly gay. For instance, Qantas Airlines. President, um, uh, or the CEO rather, of Qantas Airlines, Alan Joyce. Um, Apple Computers CEO, Tim Cook, the chairman of NBC Entertainment, the former CEO of British Petroleum, chief information officer at Nike, the CEO of HSBC Bank in the UK, the CIO of J.P. Morgan Chase, the executive VP of American Express, and the list goes on and on. These are now in positions where they have significant um, um, responsibilities. My point is that unless churches accept gays in their top positions, they will not be satisfied. Think about that carefully. Will churches be free to reject homosexual priests, pastors, or administrators? Ultimately, perhaps not. <clears throat> By the way, let me point out that equality is the underlying issue in both the gay movement and the women's ordination movement. The Episcopalian Bishop Gene Robinson, the first openly gay and partnered bishop of the Episcopalian Church in America, said... It is not an accident that the women's liberation movement preceded the gay liberation movement. In other words, it was planned. Something that's not an accident was planned. They knew what they were doing. They're too intimately connected. Now, if we're going to ordain women on the basis of equality, to be consistent, we will also have to eventually ordain gays. And if we're going to open the door for a woman to be president of the church, then to be consistent, we'll have to open it to gays also, eventually. And the foundation for equality in the churches is exactly the same for both women and homosexuals. They must remove male headship. You must do away with the biblical principle of male headship in order to ordain women. And you must also, likewise, do away with the concept of the biblical concept of male headship in order to ordain gays. In other words, you have to overthrow the Bible itself. There's no other consistent approach. 
and gays know it. And the U.S. government has also begun to come after religious liberty as well um, in some other ways. Um, for instance, the Affordable Care Act, which is all about socialized medicine and, and um, uh, making health care affordable for everybody and so on. It sounds good, but it doesn't actually happen that way. But anyway, some provisions of it are offensive to people's religious liberty sensitivities. Employers are required, for instance, to provide premiums for contraceptives and abortion services. Um, and as a result, some businesses object because they are run by Christians who object to these things. There's been one case in America in which um, the court, the Supreme Court, has upheld the religious liberty of the owners of a business. That was the Hobby Lobby case some, year, some few years ago. Hobby Lobby came under the, it's a big chain store of, of, of crafts and supplies for, for hobbyists. Uh, they came under the law for um, uh, affordable care. And uh, they had more than 50 employees, which was the threshold. And um, the government said that they had to uh, uh, supply um, premiums for contraception and abortion to which they objected. Well, they took it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Sup Supreme Court actually gave them an exemption from the law because they said that um, Hobby Lobby is a close, closely held organization, meaning that it was family members who held the stock. It wasn't on the open stock exchange. Therefore, since it's a private organization, then uh, they would have an exemption from the law. Religious hospitals, schools, adoption agencies were, the fir were at first required to provide services that some believe were morally repugnant to them. And now I believe there are some exceptions for certain cases. But pharmacies are required to provide abortifacients. And the list goes on and on. There's, there's many examples of this, especially in American um, law and jurisprudence right now and in recent years. Same-sex marriage laws in various places have created all manner of religious liberty issues. Photographers uh, who refuse to uh, provide photography services for gay weddings have come under lawsuits and under court orders uh, because they refuse to do this. Cake decorators, the same thing. Wedding providers are being forced to provide services that are conscientiously repugnant to them. But it's not just America. Australia is pressuring its citizens to comply with new vaccination laws by removing its rather generous child support program from those who refuse, or for, whether for religious reasons, except in the narrowest of definitions. In other words, each nation may have a different approach to religious liberty, but all of them are now coming at religious liberty very strongly. And there are many nations that have laws that limit what can be said about other religions, particularly Muslim religions. Once upon a time, I thought that the main issue with religious liberty would be the Sunday law. And it will be the final test, of course, the mark of the beast. But like everything else in the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights and the constitutions of other nations, it must first be eroded in other areas than, in that, than directly at the main target. Uh, religious liberty is rapidly being undermined so that when the time comes for a Sunday law, people will be prepared and ready to accept it as well as having precedent in legal jurisprudence. There's another tipping point, and that is the ecumenical movement. We've gone to the point in the ecumenical movement where there's no turning back. The ecumenical movement is taking aim at religious liberty, all in the name of defending religious liberty. <laughs> Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 94. Psalm 94 has a very interesting verse. It begins with verse 20 and, and then on to 21. 
Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Now, the throne of iniquity, of course, is a part of the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity is rooted and grounded in the agencies on this earth that are connected with and involve the Roman Catholic system. Um, the throne of iniquity is that which um, authorizes and puts laws into place. That's what a throne is designed to do, is to uh, establish laws and then follow up with enforcing. So a throne of iniquity is one that that legalizes iniquity and ultimately the final legalization of iniquity would be the legalization of a day of worship that is not approved in the Ten Commandments. In other words, Sunday. Sunday becomes the day of worship by law. And so by framing mischief by a law, that's talking about Sunday laws. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, the, the Bible says. That's talking about God's people having fellowship with the throne of iniquity or Roman Catholicism. In other words, the ecumenical movement, according to Scripture, is, is something that we must not, as God's true people, we must not engage in. It will lead us down the path and we will lose our religious liberties. And we will also give up our principles of the Bible. Verse 21, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. What is this all about? Why is the throne of iniquity involved in an ecumenical movement? It's so that they can condemn innocent blood. Innocent blood are those who keep God's Ten Commandments. Innocent blood are those who are righteous in the sight of Christ and who have Christ's righteousness living in them. It is Christ's character that makes them innocent. They are innocent before God. So that's what this is talking about. They want to condemn those who are innocent before God. I think that's interesting. They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous. If two or more people gather themselves together against someone else, we call that a conspiracy. So there is a conspiracy, my friends, against God's people. And the ecumenical movement is right at the very heart of it, at the foundation of it. That's what the Bible's telling us right here in Psalm 94. And by the way, the ecumenical movement has been going on since Vatican II in the 1960s. But in recent times, we have seen people like Tony Palmer, the late Tony Palmer now, uh, working with the Pope to woo Protestants uh, and Pentecostals to unite with Rome. For instance, he brought Kenneth Copeland and James Robeson to the Vatican to have a three-hour meeting with the, with the Pope. You know, President Obama gets 45 minutes when he sees the Pope. Angela Merkel gets 40 minutes, more or less, uh, when she goes to visit the Pope. But I tell you, these Protestants are very high on the papal priority list. He even had a lunch for them. And they were high-fiving and having a great time together for three hours. He has placed a priority on bringing the ecumenical movement into line uh, or bringing more people into the ecumenical movement so they'll come into line with the Catholic Church. But why? What's so important about the ecumenical movement? Well, friends, the ecumenical movement, let me put it this way, without the ecumenical movement, there would be no chance of bringing political alignment together in the world under the papacy, under the UN and under the papacy. And the reason for that is because in the papal understanding and in the way the world works, the way it's, it is designed to work, is that... Religion and politics go together. You cannot have a unity of church and state without bringing the churches into line with the Vatican. And you cannot have political unity unless there's religious support for it. Otherwise, that will never happen. That's the way God organized the, the world to um, prevent a consolidation of church and state. Each nation has its own purposes, its own objectives. God, after the flood, said to scatter and to replenish the whole earth. 
not to congregate in cities and create political structures that would be counterproductive to God's purposes. But that's the way the world has gone. The world is now developing a globalization that is going to oppose God and His law, especially the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment in particular. But evangelicals like Rick Warren of Purpose Driven Fame uh, have now been to the Vatican to discuss various things, especially marriage in his case. Russell Moore, head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty for the largest Protestant church in America, the Southern Baptists, has also been to Rome. Joel Olstein, Joe Olstein, pardon me, has been also to Rome. And at every turn, Francis gives more time to ecumenical contacts than to political leaders. That tells you something. Even the Waldenses have succumbed to the ecumenical movement. Pope Francis visited the Waldensian, Waldensian Temple in Torino, Italy, the first time a pope has ever crossed the threshold of, the, of a Waldensian church. For the ecumenical movement to penetrate all the way to the Waldensian church is very significant because the Waldensian church was brutally persecuted by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church relentlessly and mercilessly persecuted the Waldenses throughout the dark ages of papal control. But friends, that's going to happen again. Anyone who opposes Rome in these last days eventually will be persecuted, not necessarily by Rome, but by her agencies like the United States and other governments. But the ecumenical movement, along with the charismatic pope, has cut through the layers of opposition to Rome's teachings, its practices, its sex abuse scandals, its financial scandals, etc. No longer do Protestant churches protest. Tony Palmer said it succinctly. The protest is over. Who can resist the ecumenical movement? Revelation 13, verse 7. Let's have a look at Revelation 13, verse 7. This predicts what's going to happen to God's people. Revelation 13, verse 7 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Friends, if you stand up against Rome, you will be overcome. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to fall into temptation and succumb to her, her worship laws. Not at all. What that means is that there's going to be the removal of your religious liberties, of your freedom of worship, of your freedom of speech, and other liberties. Friends, this is what's going to happen. This is what the Bible is predicting. And we now see in our time and in the world around us that the events and developments are putting in place the pillars needed in order to create and fulfill these end time prophecies. That's very important. That's very significant. And most people have no idea. And many people laugh at the idea that these prophecies mean what they mean and that they'll be fulfilled in our time. But God says that the saints will be overcome. And that's significant. It's one of the engines. The ecumenical movement is one of the engines of war against the saints. By deception, these Churches are being led into alliances with Rome. And those who stand against her, the Bible says, will be overcome. Everybody will be against them. There's only, ultimately, one final group of people, the remnant people of the church of God, of Christ, will be the only ones that stand in the way of Rome's takeover of the world. It's moral influence in the whole world. And now, in January of 2016, Pope Francis and the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill met in Cuba after a thousand years of separation between the two churches. That too is significant because now all the Orthodox churches, and there's five major ones, they all now are in um, league and collaboration with Rome in one way or another. 
The ecumenical movement is designed to make all religions friendly to Rome so that when you have to give testimony, in re like for instance in Revelation 14 verses 6 to 12, and uh, that's about the three angels' messages, and Revelation 18, 1 to 5, in the appeal to come out of her and uh, be separate, most people will think you're a religious extremist. Already people in Western nations are being trained to think very negative thoughts about those labeled extremists. And there are plenty of religious extremists out there giving them a good reason to do so. And if you're villainized as an extremist, they will justify strong measures against you. I used to wonder how America and other Western nations would lose their religious liberty. But it seems so strange to me because the, the defenses against religious freedom or the loss of religious freedom were very strong. And I could not understand how it would happen. But today we not only see that it will happen, but we also see how it's happening. At 9-11, all that, that, all that changed. And as I have watched it over the years since then, I see more clearly how it is being developed. People with a clear understanding of Bible prophecy will never comprehend a, a, the movements taking place in stealth and secrecy. Yet, at least some of them are right out in the open where you can see them. Great Controversy, page 49, makes this interesting statement. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly, as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. This is talking about the early church. But friends, do you think that it could happen today? Here's a quote from Great Controversy, page 581. That other one was at the beginning of the book. This one is now at the end of the book. God's word has given us warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Only when it's too late to escape the snare. And many of them are already involved so deeply that they cannot escape. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. The ecumenical movement works in stealth. And though it works out in the open, its ultimate purpose is hidden. It renders the Roman Catholic Church harmless in the eyes of most people. And it prepares them to persecute the true followers of Christ. The target is your right to worship God according to his law. And now you can see that to do that, Satan has to get people to reject the law, particularly the fourth commandment. Then he has to find ways to erode religious liberty without attacking the Sabbath. And too often we are paranoid about what will happen regarding Sunday worship and the Sabbath. And a lot of people hype anything that has to do with Sunday. But the ecumenical movement is, a, is an approach that is very subtle and very stealthy. But speaking of Sunday laws, it's very interesting. There, there's still things that happen uh, around. Uh, for instance, the Arizona Senator Sylvia Allen, speaking of the horrible erosion of the soul of America, she said, we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity we have. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. That's quite a statement. A law requiring everyone to attend the church on Sunday? Well, 
<laughs> the European Sunday Alliance has been working on that for a long time. It has been working toward a common day of rest so families can spend time together, including worship. And it's for the health, of safety and work, of health and safety of workers as well. It's also for social cohesion, they say. These are all things that are public. It's, they're well known. Notice that these are secular arguments in support of Sunday rest. And they are promoted by Rome, the Jesuits, and a number of other agencies. By the way, there are four levels of Sunday laws. And we probably need to understand what those are. Level one is Sunday closing laws, where the sh shops and businesses are closed on Sunday. That's, that's a law that's common in many, many places throughout Europe and, and even in a few places in America and perhaps other parts of the world. Level two Sunday law is Sunday rest laws. That means that people must rest on Sunday. They cannot hang their laundry out to dry. They cannot uh, mow the lawn. They can't do other activities on Sunday. It's Sunday rest. They can't fix the windows on their house or the deck or porch or whatever. You know, those things are activities that are, are, um, are not included in Sunday rest. Although, by the way, sporting events are included. Uh, don't think that we're going to lose our Sunday footy or our Sunday soccer games or uh, any other types of uh, sports that are played or observed on Sunday. That's considered to be family time, recreation time, where people can get together and go out to the, to the ball game and, and watch uh, the players play. So that, that's not going to be part of the problem. But Sunday rest laws require um, that... The citizens do not do certain things on Sunday in order to distract them from the things that, are th that they're supposed to do. Level three is Sunday worship laws. Sunday worship laws um, require everyone to worship on Sunday. Now, we have very, very few of these in present modern day. But they are coming according to the Bible. Revelation 13 makes that clear. But it's not only that. Sunday worship laws fly in the face of the Ten Commandments. And that's the fourth commandment we're talking about, the one that requires that, that uh, God's people worship Him on the seventh-day Sabbath, which is a different day than Sunday. Um, the seventh-day Sabbath is in conflict with Sunday worship. The Ten Commandments are in conflict with Sunday worship. And therefore, it's important that we understand that the time is coming when these will happen. Now, Sunday closing laws and Sunday rest laws lay the foundation for Sunday worship laws. Um, and each level has increasing penalties for violation. Um, but without Sunday rest laws and without Sunday closing laws you'll never be able to have Sunday worship laws. So the aim is to have Sunday worship laws and not only that level four is anti-Sabbath laws. Sabbath anti-Sabbath laws for instance require people to uh, not worship on the Sabbath and they require they're required to work on the Sabbath. Now friends you might say this is impossible. How are they ever going to come with those kind of laws against the law of God and against certain people who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath? But friends, if you think about it, they've already, we've already had them in history. And history does what? History repeats itself. And we'll soon come back to the point where these laws will come in again. These laws were implemented, or similar laws were implemented for Sunday worship and anti-Sabbath laws during the Middle Ages when Rome ruled the world, when Rome ruled the empire, the Holy Roman Empire. And now that she is constructing the Holy Roman Empire all over again, as we've been showing you in our series on the prophetic principles of the New World Order, 
We will see this happen again because Rome never changes. Only the surface of her skin, the color of her skin, like a chameleon, changes. She accommodates wherever she has to. But eventually, she will bring out this great principle. Romanism in the old world, apostate Protestantism in the new world will pursue a similar course to those who keep all of God's commandments. Sunday rest laws are not conscience laws. Sunday closing laws are not conscience laws. These laws do not violate your conscience. You can actually comply with them. But level three, Sunday worship laws, this is where it conflicts with conscience because that it conflicts with the Ten Commandments. And when that happens, you cannot abide by those laws. Those Sunday worship laws lay the foundation for the anti-Sabbath laws. So one comes before the other and ultimately, in the end, there will be a death penalty at the anti-Sabbath law level, which will finally be imposed upon God's people. But friends, what amazes me is that we are living around it all right now. It's brewing. You can actually see it. You can feel it under the surface if you know what you're looking for. Friends, make your calling and election sure. If you put it off, the events that are unfolding around us will become so overwhelming that they, and they will surprise you that you will collapse in one big heap. Make your calling and election sure. Let go of sin. Let go of anything that you know is in contrary to the will of God in your life. And you know what those things are. God knows what those things are. So be honest with God. Let God have your life. Let God take over and give you the power to resist the temptations of the devil. Let God take over your life and give you freedom, freedom that you've never had before, freedom from sin that will give you the joy of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ and His power in your life. Let His character infuse itself into your life so that you can see uh, his work, his hand in your experience. So God bless you and may you keep faithful until Jesus comes through all these difficulties and challenges that are coming upon God's people in the near future. Let us kneel as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the prophecies of Scripture. We thank you for warning us of what is to come so that we may prepare for it. And Father in heaven, give us victory over the temptations of the devil. Give us your strength and power to give us the, the sense of your presence that we may always think of Christ whenever Satan brings a temptation and, there, and thereby faithfully resist his temptations. And as they strengthen... May our faith strengthen, may our experience deepen, and may we walk with Christ every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.